Uh, welcome everyone for the next seminar of uh, probability and stochastic process from the NEUSP. And uh, this week we have with us Professor uh, Renato dos Santos from Federal University of Minas Gerais. So welcome Renato, and uh, he's going to speak about mass concentration in parabolic Anderson models for us. Great. Yeah. So yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation, Aline. I'm very very happy uh, to be able to talk in this seminar to you and to present. Uh, this work, these works uh, to you. So let me start presenting. Let me share my screen with you. Let's see if it works. It was working before, so I hope it works now. Can, can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Great, okay. So, all right, so I want to tell you about this, uh, this Basically, this topic of the parabolic Anderson model and this phenomenon of mass concentration. So this is something that I started to, to study when I was doing a, a postdoc uh, in Berlin. And I, I, have to, I have to admit that before that, um, I knew about this model, but I always had the impression that this model is a little bit uh, boring or not so interesting. I don't know but I've changed my mind a lot. And nowadays I really like this model a lot. And I'll try to convince you why I think it's, it's a nice model, okay? So let me start, let me start. And first thing I have to do is to tell you, to explain to you my title, okay? So what is this parabolic Anderson model? Okay, so the definition is the following. It's basically a stochastic uh, PDE, okay? So he, here's the PDE, it's a Cauchy problem. So I have a certain function of, of uh, space, of time and space, u of t and x, and I'm t uh, the equation that I want to set up, sorry, the equation that I want to set up is the time derivative of this function u equals the Laplacian plus a certain multiplicative potential, which is called here uh, xi, okay? And I'm looking at this equation with discrete space. So I'm taking the, the d-dimensional lattice, zd, x is living in the, in the space, but time is continuous, okay? So this is really a time derivative. And uh, yeah, for this talk, I'm mainly going to, to uh, concentrate on the case where I start the equation from, from this initial condition where uh, the function is localized at the origin. So the function is one, uh, time zero, right? The u of zero x is one if x equals to zero and is zero otherwise. All right. Okay. So this gives me like a system of of equations on um, for for each x. There's this coupled syst uh, system of equations that depends on this Laplacian. This is the discrete Laplacian, and this is some uh, multiplicative potential, which I am going to take this potential to be a random potential and distributed in an IID fashion, okay? So this is a simple setup. And this Laplacian that I wrote here, that's the discrete Laplacian. So this is just, uh, so if I want to evaluate what it means to take the Laplacian of a certain function f defined on, on the lattice ZD. So this is just summing over all neighbors of x. So y neighboring of x, that means that the, L1 distance between uh, X and Y is one. So, uh, so the, those are the, the typical neighbors. And um, I'm summing over these neighbors, this difference here, Fy minus F of X, okay? Um, all right, so here, from here you can already Sorry, see- does, The sum is uh, only uh, over Fy? No, no, the sum is over both. So oh. it's really- you should okay. Put, okay. Okay. Otherwise, I should multiply by d here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You th thanks for the question. Yeah. So, uh, right. Uh, okay. So by now, I guess you can already see where the word parabolic comes from because this is an uh, this is a parabolic equation, right? So this is some sort of parabolic equation that I'm writing. So this is where the parabolic term comes from. And the Anderson word comes because this uh, operator that sits here on the right-hand side of the equation, this linear operator given by the sum of the Laplacian 
and this multiplicative field. This is called, uh, in, in a solid state physics, this is called the Anderson operator. It's a type of Schrodinger operator. Okay, so uh, this is, if you think about it, this is a really simple equation because it's a linear equation. But the fact that I'm taking uh, a random, very disordered potential here makes it interesting. Okay, so let's think for a second about what these two terms are doing here. So the Laplacian term and the, and the potential term. So let's think a little bit. So suppose for, for a moment that I would consider this equation, uh, say, without, without the potential term, okay? I, I cross this potential term and I solve this, this equation just with the Laplacian. And I could even consider some other initial condition than, than this. And what happens is that because the, the Laplacian takes, tends to make the solution very smooth, with time, what would happen is that even if I start with a very, very irregular uh, initial condition, soon enough, this, uh, this uh, solution for large times is going to become very, very smooth. Okay, it's going to become very regular. Uh, if, on the other hand, I do the opposite, so I, I cross out uh, the Laplacian term instead of the potential term, then uh, since I started out with a very disordered field. So the, the values here, the values of psi for different x are varying quite wildly, right? So uh, even if I start with a very, very simple initial condition, let's say that I start with everywhere equal to one, completely uniform, very soon my field is going to be very, very irregular, right? Because the rate of growth, right? So if I, if I cross out this Laplacian term, these equations decouple, right? So it's just the solution at each site is just an exponential with the with the rate given by by uh, oops given by psi right. So they are going to grow in a really really different fashion. So it means the solution is going to become very rough very soon. Okay. So you see uh, that this uh, these two terms they have a very different effects. So they are competing. They are somehow competing in this equation. The Laplacian wants to make the solution smoother. The potential is trying to make the solution rough. And in some sense, we're going to see that the potential is going to win. Okay, the winner is going to be the potential. And this is kind of the interest of, of this problem. One of the main um, reasons why, why this problem uh, is interesting. So let me try to convince you of that. So before I say that, let me first do the following. So, okay, I gave you a description. Now you know what my title, uh, well, not the whole title, but at least the model is. Um, but, okay, this is a very, okay, this is a kind of uh, a dry description, right? This is a, just some PDE, which is stochastic. The probability is only appearing through, uh, oops, oops, through this random potential, right? But we are probabilists here, so... We love to see some particles jumping around, right? I don't know about you, but at least I, I do. Uh, I like this type of thing. So we want to see some particles jumping around. So I want to tell you a little bit about probabilistic interpretations of this equation. Okay, so here's one, which is a type of um, population genetics kind of model. Okay, so it's going to be a particle system. So let's describe a certain particle system where uh, I start from a single particle at time zero, and I put this particle at the origin. Okay, so that this corresponds to the initial condition of the equation that, that was um, here on your screen before. Very well. So how does this system evolve in, in the following way? Okay, let's suppose that I've evolved the system for a little bit of time, and now there are some particles in the system. So each particle is going to independently do the following. So I'm assuming that uh, I'm talking about one particle situated at a certain site X. So there are several things that it can do. It can produce a new particle and the rate with which it does that is equal to the positive part of the random potential that is located at this speed. So this means if the particle is sitting at a place where the potential is positive, then it's reproducing with the rate given by the potential. Okay, it's generating a new particle with this rate. 
So the particle can also disappear. Okay, if it's sitting on a place where the potential is negative, then it means that it's going to disappear with the rate given by the uh, absolute value of, of the potential there. Okay. Uh, and the other thing that it can do is the following. This is completely independent of the, of the potential. It can jump to a neighbor y of x, and each neighbor has the same rate, and the rate is given by 1. All right? So uh, if, I, if I continue to evolve the system from a single particle, it could be that the particle just dies in the very beginning of, of time, and nothing happens. But it could be that this particle starts to move and starts to... Uh, produce other particles and those particles start to move by themselves and so on and it could be that the system is going to survive forever okay or for a very long time and uh, what is the relation between this system and the equation that I've uh, put on the on the screen for you before is the following if I take the number if I take here the number of point the number of particles, in the system, in this branching system, that are situated at the space-time point t, comma, x. And I take the expected value of this number over this whole mechanism here, this mechanism according to which the particle splits, disappears, jumps, etc. I take the expectation with, with respect to this uh, mechanism, and what I obtain is exactly the solution of that equation that was on the board before. Okay, so this is one probabilistic interpretation for that equation. Okay, so let's say if you were interested in this particle system, then you could look at the parabolic Anderson model as a some sort of first approximation to what the system does, in the sense that this is the expectation of the system. Okay, so this is one motivation, one motivation for it. And now we can also interpret this the system in a little bit more uh, biological language in the following fashion. So I could say that my space ZD, I could call every point in ZD a phenotype, okay? And then if I have this interpretation, then the value of the potential on, on X, that represents, since this represents the rate of growth of particles that are sitting at that phenotype, this means this is the fitness of this phenotype. And well, since I'm changing phenotype when I move, this could represent mutation, okay? So this would be a kind of toy model for population genetics. And this toy model is certainly extremely simple and missing some very important, uh, very important features that we would expect from a real a more serious um, population genetics model, for example. There is no logistic limit to the growth of this population, etc. But it could still be interesting, let's say, in a, in, a, in a simplified setting where maybe we are following the evolution of a, of a population before, long before the logistics limit, uh, exactly, uh, etc. Okay, so this, this furnishes to us, this gives us to us an interpretation of what this particle system could mean for us. And well, one first step in studying such, such a particle system could be to uh, look at the parabolic Anderson model, to look at the solution here, which is the expectation. All right? So this is one, uh, this is one motivation, and a nice connection between that equation and something more probabilistic. Very well. So let me next talk to you about a different type of motivation for this equation for the parabolic Anderson uh, model, uh, which is the following. So this, despite this being a very, very simple, uh, very simple equation, very simple model, it does have some very interesting features. There are some phenomena that happen that make this model quite interesting. So this is one of the simplest models that we can think of that show a certain type of uh, phenomenology, which is the following, which is known as intermittency, okay? So intermittency is, so roughly or heuristically uh, speaking, uh, is a phenomenon where the system, the, the solution that you have, it does, not, it does not become homogeneous. It does not homogenize at large scales. 
So if we start looking at the profile of the solution from uh, in larger and larger scales, larger from further and further apart, this picture does not become uh, smoother, it becomes rougher and rougher. So in other words, the, there are some very small, relatively small areas here where the mass of the solution is really concentrated. And if you look further and further, this doesn't disappear. This effect doesn't disappear, it stays there, okay? So it doesn't homogenize. So this type of phenomenology is important, I think, uh, well, on, on, on two levels at least. So on the one hand, this is a type of phenomenon that appears in very interesting, uh, in very interesting situations or physical situations or models. For example, this is connected with uh, turbulence in some systems, uh, etc. So this, the, the the phenomenon is interesting in itself, okay, because it, it shows up in some uh, in some real uh, systems. Uh, on the other hand, it also has the following um, aspect that uh, since, you know, since the system is becoming more and more concentrated, uh, heuristically at least, it means that this could provide to us a way to simplify the description of the system itself. It means maybe in large scales, it's not so important for me to know exactly, precisely all the details of what the system is doing, but let's say if I knew the location of each one of those regions that we call islands, if I know the location of the islands, if I know the amount of islands that are really important for me and how the potential looks inside, um, etc., then I could give like an effective description of my, of my solution that is a very, very complicated object, random object, I could provide an effect, much simpler effective description for for uh, the system okay so the rest of my talk is basically going to be about this of trying to describe this phenomenon of uh, intermittency uh, geometrically uh, and in some sense obtain an effective description for the solution or of this equation okay with this approach so let me give you next a little bit of a historical overview of how this uh, intermittency phenomenon appears in the literature uh, of the parabolic Anderson model, as I as I introduced to you to you here, so let me introduce this notation. I have this capital U of t. That's the total mass of the system. So if I sum the solution over all points of the lattice, that gives me at the point t in time the the total mass of the system. And in fact, uh, if I'm not wrong, I'm not really familiar with the physics literature here, but um, the intermittency. Uh, I think it was introduced really in the physics literature, an approach to characterize intermittency in terms of the moments of this random variable capital U of t. So yeah, I remind you that this is still a random variable, okay? Because the equation for u, that's a random equation, right? There's the random potential. So the solution is a random solution. So the sum here is a random variable. So I can talk about the moments under this law of the of the random potential, and in the physics literature, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, intermittency it, it was proposed to characterize intermittency in terms of moments. And okay, there was this paper, this very important paper in the field by Jürgen Gärtner and Stan, Stanislav Mochanov in 1990, where they really started the more mathematical rigorous. Uh, mathematically rigorous treatment of, of this model, and they they do take this approach of taking uh, describing intermittency in terms of of the moments. So basically, what it uh, the condition would be that if you take these moments, if you take the pth moment of the total mass, and you compare it to a different moment, say the qth moment, with say q bigger than p, and if you see that uh, as t goes to infinity, the qth moment grows much faster than the pth moment, then this would tell you that the system is intermittent, okay? There is a whole uh, heuristic explanation of why this should be the case. I'm not going to go into this uh, here. Well, you can read this in this paper by Gethin Mochanov. But basically in this paper, 
So they, they treat uh, rigorously the model, they define it, they show conditions for existence of solutions, etc., etc. And they also show the following, that basically intermittency always holds as soon as you have a random field that is really random. Okay, it doesn't have to be IID, but as soon as it's somehow really random, then the system is uh, intermittent. All right? Okay, so this work here uh, motivated the study of the asymptotics of these moments of the total mass. So in the next several years, there's been a lot of literature uh, studying exactly that, okay? So you take either the, uh, you take the log of both, okay? Log, log of the total mass or log of the, of the pith moment of the total mass. And you can study how this, um, what's a, a symptotic expression in terms of T for, for this. This has been studied in a, in a series of papers that are very, very interesting papers. Uh, for example, in this last paper that I mentioned here from 2006, there's a very, very nice description of the uh, universality classes that can appear uh, in, in this asymptotic expansion, uh, which I'm not going to describe in detail to you. Uh, but what I wanted to say is the following. So throughout these studies in this literature, the methods of proof that they developed to study these logarithmic asymptotics, they provided some so sorts of heuristic ideas to believe that uh, intermittency could also be described really geometrically. Like this picture that I showed you before, that you could really uh, describe uh, the size of those islands, of those intermittent islands, the height, the shape of the potential inside, etc. This was not really proved in these in this papers here, but the methods that they used really suggested this. And out of this analysis, okay, there is one thing that comes out, which is a certain class of um, critical potentials, which are the following. So let me tell you what the potentials are. Basically, the important thing are the upper tails of the potential, okay? So take a potential that has this behavior here. So the probability that the random field, say, at the origin, right, it doesn't matter because it's an IID field, but let's say that the, the oops, sorry about that. Uh, the probability that this field at the origin uh, is bigger than a certain number u, this decays with u like e to the minus e to the u over rho. So double, uh, doubly exponentially fast, okay? And this rho is just some parameter here in this, uh, in this family of distributions. So in this literature, they identified that uh, this family of distribution uh, distributions here, it's critical in the following sense that if you take potentials whose tails are heavier than this, heavier than double exponential, then that picture with the, with the intermittent islands, uh, the islands reduce to just to points, just to a single point, okay? So it becomes trivial in some sense, the islands becomes just points. On the other hand, if you take tails that are lighter than double exponential, that decay uh, slower, uh, no, sorry, that decay faster, of course, so that are lighter, lighter, uh, lighter tails, uh, so it means that the size of the islands doesn't stay fixed with time. It has to grow with time at a certain minimal rate, okay? At a certain specified rate. And well, exactly at the critical, the critical case, this case here, the islands neither grow nor, nor shrink with time, okay? So this is a kind of critical behavior with respect to intermittency. So this suggests that this case, the double exponential tails, those are very interesting for this problem because this is a type of critical critical behavior for, for the model, okay? So the shortly afterwards, there was a paper by uh, Gert and Mochanov and also my former boss, Wolfgang Koenig, where they really treat in the case of double exponential tails. So they really explore this question, can we make these heuristics uh, uh, can we turn these heuristics into a proof? Okay, and they do, they really do. So what's the statement of the theorem? Okay, so they are treating the case where the tails are really double exponential. So they show the following. 
there exists a certain subset, they call it gamma t, okay? The subset is in some sense not very big. They show that it grows uh, slower with t than any power of t, okay? These sets, we can think about them like centers for those intermittent islands, and they show the following property for the set is the following. Uh, if you give to me, or if you give to them, a certain tolerance, let's say that you, you say, you, you know, I would really like to have 90% of, uh, of the total mass in my region, within my islands. Then they tell you, okay, no problem. We can deal with 90%. They compute a certain number R, which depends on this 90% epsilon here in the case, right? And they tell you the following for this R that they computed, they can form this ratio. They sum, they sum the solution here over all the points that are not very far away from the set gamma. So they sum the R, the, the capital R, neighborhood of the set uh, gamma, they sum the solution in there and compared to the total mass, so you divide it by the total mass and it becomes very large when T is large. So basically they are saying, okay, if you just look at all the centers in this uh, set gamma and you put little balls with radius R around them, the solution inside there, if you sum it, uh, 90 per, at least 90% of the total mass is already in there, okay? And okay, instead of 90, you can ask for 99, 99.9, etc., etc. They are going to have to change this R, but still it works, okay? So the for any, uh, any tolerance here that you give, you can always find a large enough radius that uh, is going to make this work, okay? So this is basically the result. So they are really proving this geometric uh, picture where there is a certain set of centers which is relatively small, relatively sparse. And if you just put finite balls around each one of the centers, this region given by the union of the balls already captures almost all of the total mass of the system, okay? There are several other things that they do in this paper as well. So I'm going to mention here the other thing that they, they do very nicely is the following. Uh, inside each one of these balls, you can characterize very precisely how the potential and how the, the solution looks like. So you can really, there's a, there, are, there are very nice variational problems that appear that are non-trivial, um, very, very interesting in itself as well. But this gives you, uh, in some sense, uh, this effective description that I was telling you, well, as long as we have the, the set gamma t, I know precisely how the potential and how the solution looks inside uh, each one uh, of these balls, all right? Okay, so the next question that appeared after this is the following. So, okay, so uh, these guys, they gave to us the set gamma t, which is, well, the definition is not that, it's not that simple. And well, in principle, this could also be, well, it's not a very large set, but it's, it's growing, right? It could be growing at a certain rate. So one thing that did not come out of the heuristics of the original literature is the following. How many of these points are actually necessary? Okay. Do we need really a growing number of islands? Can we uh, get away with just a bounded number of islands? Could we just take one island? What would, we, what would be the case? Okay. So this was a, a question that became interesting after, after this paper here and was investigated. So it was not immediately investigated exactly in this case, because this case is a bit more complicated because of the this uh, uh, critical aspect of, of the potential, etc. But uh, uh, people started to uh, uh, study this model on other tails, tails that are even heavier, that were not considered before, because, because people were describing intermittency in terms of the moments of the total mass. But since now we are interested in, uh, interested in describing intermittency uh, geometrically, you can uh, forget about these moments and really just think about the geometric description, okay? So if you allow yourself to do that, you can consider other potentials for which the moments don't even exist. This is one such case, okay, where we would take 
the heaviest possible tails for the random potential given by this Pareto uh, tails. Uh, it's necessary to take this uh, parameter alpha larger than the dimension, otherwise the solution blows up. Okay, so you see this is really very heavy for the for the definition of the problem. Uh, but then you could expect if you take something really very heavy tailed that the uh, concentration effect would be even more pronounced and maybe this could simplify the model for you and make the proof of, uh, of everything easier, okay? And it, it, it indeed is the case. So in this case, uh, this is the case where the most detailed results are available to us so far, okay? And this was a, a paper, 2009, by so Wolfgang König, there's also Hubert Lacroix, who is now uh, Timpa, and Peter Mertes and Ada Sidorova. They consider these Pareto tails and they prove a very, very extreme form of uh, concentration, which is the following, is the, the most extreme localization that we can hope for, is the following. There is one single site of ZD that depends on T, such that if we look at the, the amount of mass that sits exactly on that site, so the solution at that site at time T, compare it to the total mass, the ratio converts to one in probability. Okay, this is something that became uh, known in this literature as complete localization. Uh, yeah, it's, it's maybe uh, not very good uh, terminology because this means something completely different in other fields, but in this literature it became known as exactly this convergence here that I'm talking about. So basically the whole mass is contained on a single point asymptotically. Okay, all right. Well, actually this paper uh, it became, it, it became uh, more famous for a different result, which is the following. So you could, after you prove this improbability, you could ask yourself, can I prove the same thing almost surely? And well, when, after you think for a little bit, you realize that you cannot. You cannot, why can't you? Because, well, this process here, Z of T, it lives on a lattice, so it has to jump around, okay? On the other hand, the solution ut of x is continuous in time, right? It's continuous in time. So at a time of jump, you cannot have you cannot move the whole mass immediately from one side to the other. So it's impossible to prove. Well, okay, maybe I, I didn't convince you really, but you would have to think a little bit longer and convince yourself that it would be simply impossible, okay, under these conditions, to. Um, to prove the same result here almost surely. However, in the same paper, they do prove the strongest form of concentration that you could hope for almost surely, which they call a two cities theorem, because is it's simply uh, considering one additional site. So instead of considering just one site, if you consider two, so instead of this solution at one site, I sum the solution at these two sites, Z1 and Z2, and then they are able to prove this almost sure convergence, okay? This is the strongest thing that, you, that we could hope for, uh, all right? So this, is a, this was known as a two cities uh, uh, theorem. Okay, so after that, there was a lot of development. So basically people believe that this complete localization holds for uh, any tails that are heavier than double exponential. And this was explored in the literature in a series of papers for different uh, with different assumptions. Okay, so for viable tails, for example, there were these works here that, that I mentioned. But still the picture in the double exponential case, this was still open because it was a little bit more complicated because the structure of the islands is non-trivial. They don't reduce to a point. You cannot hope to have this complete localization there. You will need at least a little bit of uh, a few sites because the structure of the islands is really non-trivial. Okay, so this is what uh, Wolfgang Koenig proposed to me when I started the postdoc with him. And this is something we did together and also together with Marek Biskup a few years back, where we really proved this. So what did we prove? We considered the case with double exponential tails, and we also proved basically the strongest form of concentration that we could hope for, which is the following. Uh, within that set gamma t from before, you can pick just one point, Z of T, just one center, 
and we can play the same game as before, okay? If you tell me I want to have 99% of the mass, I go here to my notebook, I make a little computation, and I come up with some radius r, where if you just sum the solution now, just really, uh, oops, just really uh, within this distance r of this point that I gave to you, then compared to the total mass, it gives me almost everything, okay? It gives me uh, asymptotically for large times, I should have this written here, with probability tending to one as time is large, this uh, ratio here is larger than the tolerance that, that you gave to me, okay? So this is again uh, the strongest form of concentration that we could, that we could hope for, at least uh, in this case. Very well. Uh, something I didn't mention to you yet, so let me mention uh, this to you now, uh, because this appears in our paper as well. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that this is a very simple model, so it's true. So this model, it's interesting, but it's simple enough that we have very good mathematical tools to analyze it. And one byproduct of that is that we can have some really satisfying limiting theorems as we like in probability, as we, as we all love in probability. So here's one example. If I take this site, this concentration center Z of T, I have here the explicit normalizer for it. And I also have an explicit limit in distribution for it as time goes to infinity, okay? So this is really nice. This is something that we really like. And in fact, this is not the only thing that we get. We get a host of uh, results that can uh, show us things about uh, scaling limits. And also uh, this other result here is a type of aging that, that we can get. So here, uh, the result here is the following. So consider again this uh, center, right? The center of localization Z of T. Uh, this result here, the second result is telling you that this center is jumping slower and slower as time goes by. In fact, if I look here at the first time after time t, where I jump, this difference, this increment in time, scales as t again for, for large t. Because if you, if you, well, divide this time here by t, then this converges to something that is strictly bigger than one, almost surely, okay? Uh, so uh, this is something, this is also something interesting. It means that this whole picture of the solution if the whole solution is slowing down, right? Well, okay, I'm showing here that the site is slowing down. But since the solution is concentrated around the site, then the solution itself is also slowing down, okay? In some sense. So we can also prove some uh, analogous result for the profile of the solution itself. And uh, well, I should say this type of result that I'm mentioning to you here, this is absolutely not uh, unique in our paper. This is very typical of the type of results that people get in the parabolic analysis model that I didn't mention before just because I wanted to be brief. But uh, this type of result that you can get comes really out of these very good mathematical tools that we have to deal with the, with the problem, to deal with the model, okay? Uh, so uh, let's see how far I get. Um, I wanted to maybe tell you a thing or two about uh, tools, improves, etc. But before I go there, I also want to tell you a little bit about uh, two extensions of this model that I have uh, worked uh, with as well, and I, I think are quite interesting. So um, this belongs to this thing that I want to convince you that this is an interesting model. So, so let me try to do this a little bit further. Okay, so here's one extension that you can consider or a type of, of extension that you can consider is the following. So in my original equation, I had uh, this, this Cauchy problem with the Laplacian and the random potential. What if we take a different, a different operator instead of the Laplacian, some Laplacian-like operator, but different, let's say a disordered Laplacian, okay? So here's one simple example. I could consider, instead of the Laplacian, I could consider this Laplacian uh, composed with a positive random field, or more precisely, with the inverse of a positive random field. And well, this, this operator that appears here, uh, this operator that appears here, this is the uh, a joint operator of the generator of the so-called Bouchot trap model, 
okay? And well, this is uh, this also is going to appear in the model, okay? So if I consider this equation and I go back to that um, biological interpretation that I told you about, then I'm going to also be able to interpret the meaning of these of this new IID field, of this positive random field. Because in the Bouchot trap model, what happens is that the random walk is delayed. The random walk still has jumps that are uniformly distributed among the neighbors, but it has to wait a certain time, which is exponential, with a random mean. Okay, and the mean is exactly uh, this here. This and so because uh, this becomes uh, very large, if if sigma of x is very large, we can think about this as a type of stability of a phenotype, meaning if the system, if, if a certain individual belongs to a certain phenotype, it's going to, and, and this uh, field here, sigma of x is very large, the, the individual is going to take a very long time to mutate into a neighbor, okay? So this can be uh, interpreted as a sort of stability, all right? Uh, so I should tell you about the theorem, and I should also say, so this is something in collaboration with two people, Stephen Weihad and uh, Richard Timer. Both are based in, in London. Uh, this is a work from uh, a little while back. And these, these two guys, my co-authors, they were the ones who introduced this model. And, well, they had some motivation that comes basically from this uh, biological interpretation. Um, that maybe I won't go really into detail because I want to tell you other things as well. And what we do, uh, what we do is the following. So we are interested in the following, in the following phenomenon. So remember that uh, if I have uh, double exponential tails, if I have double exponential tails like here, in the original parabolic Anderson model, then I do not get complete localization, right? We've seen that the islands have a non-trivial structure. But on the other hand, this stability, this increased stability, the possibility to have a few sites that are very atypically stable, this could improve in some sense, at least heuristically. It's easy to believe that this could make the system more localized. Okay? And this is basically what we prove. All right? So we have some uh, hypothesis here, meaning that. Uh, well, for technical reasons, we only take traps that are bounded from below, but the real assumption is this one here, saying that the, the, these, this field is unbounded. It can get very large. If I just look in a large enough box, I can get it as large as I want. Okay. So under these two hypotheses, we do show that now the system changed. The system really uh, localizes completely, like here. Okay. And we, well, we can also study some other properties of the system. So here's another thing that we can that we can talk about: the trap at the localization site. Well, as maybe you could expect from these heuristics, it also grows to infinity. Okay, at the localization site, the 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 site is becoming more and more stable. And this has to do with the original motivation that my co-authors had, because in the physics literature, they found some studies, some uh, physics paper that was arguing that in such a system, the population should localize in uh, phenotypes that are typically fit and are typically stable, like here. Uh, yeah, I should also say, I didn't write it here, but I should also say that we can prove that uh, the same thing for the potential, okay? So the site is also a typically, a typically fit. Very well. Okay, let me tell you about one more extension that is something that I worked uh, with more recently. So another thing that this is really not very well explored in the, in the literature of this model, which is the following. There is a lot of study in the case uh, where you have the graph, uh, the lattice, the d-dimensional lattice, ZD, but very little done in other graphs. There is a little bit, but not a lot. In particular, there was nothing yet on a random graph. And this is something that uh, we wanted to do. So this is now together with uh, Frank and Hollander and Wolfgang. So Frank was my PhD advisor. And if I remember correctly, this is something, this is an idea that came from him because he's very interested uh, nowadays to study dynamics on random graphs, okay? 
and we asked ourselves, can we do the same thing? And well, for now, we, we have a more modest type of result, which is uh, the following. So as I, I explained to you in the beginning, right, the, usually the, the study of the pump starts with studying the asymptotics of the total mass of the moments and also Almoshur asymptotics. So here we did the Almoshur asymptotics, okay? And uh, actually it's already quite interesting. So let me try to tell you a little bit about uh, what's going on here. So what's really different about this case is that the geometry of a tree is very different from ge the geometry of, of ZD. So in particular, uh, balls grow exponentially fast with the radius, right? So this, what you see here inside, um, here, oops, sorry. I'm getting mixed up with my, my tools here. Okay, so this is what you he see here inside of the logarithm. This is basically the volume of the area explored by a random walk or explored in the parabolic Anderson model until the, the uh, uh, until you find this localization point, more or less, okay? The, the, the volume of the area of interest, so, so to speak, okay? Because this dictates somehow the height that the potential can, can reach. There are some other terms. There's another term here, this term here, which also appears in uh, many of these results that I've told you before. This is a constant that comes out of a variational problem. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it in just a moment. But there's something new that appears here, which is this row that we uh, write like this because this term really is kind of a new effect. It comes out of this uh, exponential structure of, of, the, of the graph, and it has to do uh, somehow with the probability for a random walk uh, to do, to reach the localization site, so to speak, in a relatively short time. And if I have time, maybe this will become a bit more clear. Uh, maybe I don't have more time, but let's see. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to say is that, okay, this number uh, chi here, this is the minimum of a certain variational problem. This is something that appears throughout the, the, the literature of the pump, okay? And this also has to do with those heuristics that I told you about, and in particular, in our case, the analysis of this constant, okay, it suggests to us that there is also a concentration phenomenon going on here, and the concentration takes place at least if I take this row large enough, meaning that my, my potential is kind of localized enough, at least for a large row, this suggests that the solution is going to concentrate in a region of this Galton Watson tree that is a subtree and also a subtree with the minimum possible degree that I can that, that I can reach. Okay. This is something we have not proved yet, but uh, the analysis here certainly suggests that. So I guess now I'm basically done with the results that I wanted to tell you about. So I should ask how much time do I still have? Because I spent a lot of time telling you all these things. If I do have a little bit more time, I would like to mention some of the proof ideas. But if not, maybe I leave it here. Uh, we have 10 minutes if, or five minutes if you have questions. <laughs> Okay, so that's great. So I, I can, let's, okay. So I'll, I'll start telling you about the most important things, depending on time, let's see where we get, okay? So uh, this is something I really should tell you about. This is something I should never leave out of a talk about the pump, okay? Which is the feynman katz formula. What is the feynman katz formula? So let's uh, look at the following. Now let's consider again, the same problem that I had before, but instead of considering the problem all over ZD, I could consider the problem on a different subset that I call D here, okay? It could be infinite, it could be ZD itself, it could be finite, I don't know. And instead of starting with, ma with unit mass at zero, I start with unit mass at a certain point Z, okay? So here's the solution to, the, to that same equation, that, co that Cauchy problem in a different set starting from unit mass at the point Z and zero boundary conditions outside of the set D, okay? And very nice thing about this is that we have a probabilistic representation for the solution, which is called the Feynman-Katz representation, okay? How does it work? 
I can write it like this. Okay, I can write this. I can write the solution as an integral with respect to a certain random walk. So here is the random walk. X. This is a simple random walk on ZD. Okay. In other words. This is a random walk whose generator is exactly the discrete Laplacian on ZD. All right. So if I take this integral now, this here is the law of this simple random walk started from the point Z. Okay. If I take it, I compute, I have this exponential weight. Uh, so the exponential of this integral of the potential along the random walk. And I also take the um, indicator function where the random walk has not left the set D yet. And at time T, it sits exactly at the point X. Then this gives me a representation for my solution. So this is something very, very useful, okay? Extremely useful because I can now, as you know, as probabilists, we can now start thinking, ah, can I come up with some strategies here for the random walk that would allow the random walk to collect the best possible contribution out of this weights or out of these exponential weights here, which are so regions where the potential is really favorable in some sense. Okay. So there's another thing that this gives to me, which is uh, also important, is that I can now sum in X, right? If I sum in X here, the sum goes inside the expectation by linearity. And this means that this part here disappears, right? So I get also probabilistic uh, interpretation or representation for the total mass itself. So again, this is useful because I can try to exploit this to get this type of um, uh, probabilistic approach. Let's try to, if we are smart enough to think what this random walk should do here to make this a very good contribution, maybe we can, um, we can figure out the, the, the behavior, the real behavior. Uh, let me maybe still Sorry. say one more thing at least. Yeah, yes, question. You're saying the total mass in D. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. This is the total mass in D. Of course, this is also the total mass everywhere because I'm taking the solution with zero boundary conditions outside. Okay, but now I'm restricted yes. okay. to this case. Okay. Uh, yeah, I should also at least mention one more thing I think is also important. Uh, and, and this is the, this is something that is uh, really important for this model. Let me maybe talk about this a little in a, in a little bit. Let me first say what it is. Okay. So it's a spectral expansion or a spectral representation for the solution as well. Now I'm going to restrict to the case where my um, subset here is the finite subset. Oops. Sorry again. Sorry, uh, finite subset. Okay, and again, I consider this to be the solution with zero, zero boundary conditions and starting from unit mass at Z. Okay, but now uh, think if I look, go back to that equation, that's a linear equation, and now it's a linear equation in a finite subset of ZD, it means it's a finite system of linear equations. So that Anderson operator is now just a matrix, okay? So the solution, I can find it by taking the exponential of the matrix. But even more, the matrix is a symmetric matrix, okay? I can diagonalize the matrix. So it means that I can really write explicitly the solution here in terms of the spectral uh, characteristics of the Anderson operator here. So let me write this down. So this is the spectral representation, okay? I take lambda k in D to be the eigenvalues of the Anderson operator here in this uh, region with zero boundary conditions, okay? And I take this um, uh, phi D to be the corresponding, corresponding eigenfunctions, okay? And I can write this, of course, like this, okay? This is uh, just because this is a linear, this is a finite linear problem, okay? But now this is something extremely useful for me. So as, as I told you uh, before, one thing that is very special about this model is that we have very good tools. And those two tools that I just presented to you, the feynman katz representation, which is a probabilistic representation, and this one, which is a spectral one, more analytic, these two things combined, we can go between both and we can really 
get a lot out of them both. Okay, by studying these two aspects and comparing them, you can get uh, a, a lot out of the out of them. So since I, I don't think I'm going to have time to really go into more details that I that I planned, uh, let me just say the one thing that here in this uh, in this spectral representation here, at least very heuristically, we can already kind of believe this picture of intermittency that we saw before, okay? And uh, well, to believe that, we have to also believe in this phenomenon of Anderson localization, right? So the under Anderson operator defined on the infinite space, et cetera, this is very well known to have a certain, um, to show a certain phenomenon of Anderson localization, meaning that certain eigenfunctions at the boundary, close to the boundary of the spectrum at least, they show, they are very localized. They are very, very localized, exponentially localized. Okay, so this, not, this does not really correspond to the situation here. So of course, I'm being very heuristic here, but well, because of the nature of this operator, you could expect that these eigenfunctions here, at least, so take a look at this. Of course, the only eigenvalues that are really going to play a role in this expansion, right? The only eigenvalues are going to be the eigenvalues that are very high, that are close to the boundary of the spectrum. At least for those eigenvalues, maybe it's not very hard to believe, uh, if we know about Anderson localization, that these eigenfunctions are also going to be uh, quite localized, okay? And if we believe that, it means that the sum here is basically a superposition of very, very localized functions and then multiplied by a huge factor, right? Multiplied by this large factor. And well, only a few of them are going to contribute and the few that do contribute correspond to eigenfunctions that are very localized. So you can picture in your mind something like the picture in the first few slides that I showed to you. Okay, this is a very, this is a very heuristic thing. And a new, uh, normally it's not really uh, possible to, to make this rigorous, what I just described to you. There is one paper where they do, do uh, write a proof exactly with this argument, which is pretty beautiful, but uh, in general, that's not really the mathematical approach to this problem. Uh, but okay, so there, are, there were some other things that I wanted to tell you about. There is uh, something that is very illustrative when you uh, look for a strategy of the lower bound and uh, well, I'm not going to go into this here. There's some uh, aspects that allow us to, uh, that, that I could convince you about why, why that scale was the correct scale and some more elements that go into the proof like convergence of point processes, et cetera, et cetera. Let's not go into that, uh, but let me just give you here a few references of the papers in which I, I, I was involved in these last few years. And that's it. So just thanks. Um, yes, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Renato, for the presentation. Uh, anyone have any question or comment? May I have a question? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Nikolai Kolev. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your talk. Uh, uh, thanks thanks a uh, lot extremely extremely uh, clear extremely clear extremely well I'm, clear. I'm glad you liked it uh, thanks uh, a lot. I, I don't know if i like but it was <laughs> extremely <laughs> clear <laughs> uh, uh, first of all uh, uh, you uh, your ab abbreviation pam uh, this ah. uh, do you know that if you write PMM and after that email USP uh, Barry, you, uh, your email would get uh, Professor Moritin? <laughs> no, I don't understand. You, you, you get yeah, who? No, you if you write PAM uh, and then email USP. Uh, Imi Uspi Bear, uh, you get Professor Moritin's email. I should try to collaborate with him. No, no, uh, send this to him to see the reaction. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, now uh, I am not expert in the field, but uh, uh, I uh, would like to ask about uh, this um, uh, double exponential uh, 
trials or probably to suggest something i don't know probably Ooh, you have okay. uh, uh, more experience uh, uh, with this uh, talking about population genetics uh, genetics uh, there are two models uh, classical models which mm -hmm. are not well known uh, one of them is uh, the model of this year this is a French uh, uh, French biologist how, how do you spell it this year, uh, let me see if I can write on some place uh, aha uh -huh. uh, here uh, This year, this is uh, uh, the first uh, model. It's uh, 30, uh, uh, developed 34, 34. Uh, and there's another model, uh, Chunk Conforti. Well, what is the other model? Uh, I'm writing it. Uh, ah, okay. Chunk, Chunk Conf Conforti, yeah. Conforti. Chunk, Chunk Conforti. Uh, this is... Uh, something like uh, 1981 uh, and uh, uh, these two models uh, they uh, uh, they describe the uh, double exponential models uh, in some sense but uh, uh, they uh, describe uh, the aging of the organism aha uh -huh. that's quite interesting uh yes and jointly with this uh, uh, you probably know about uh, gompert's uh, model uh, which is uh, also double exponential uh, it uh, describes uh, the aging uh, perfectly for the humans uh, being uh, older than 30 years and this <laughs> in the base of uh, uh, life tables uh, uh, all over the world in the actuarial literature I really had never heard about this. Uh, yeah, Gompert's model, uh, if you uh, write, even I can uh, give you more information after that, but uh, not to uh, uh, not to disturb uh, the other uh, colleagues. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, please. And, 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 and something, uh, uh, I, I have uh, uh, impression that, uh, uh, do you know Hans-Jörg Aubrecher from Lausanne? No, no, no. Uh, I, I'll write the name Hans uh, York I'll uh, probably uh, I'm writing uh, wrong here's uh, he's a professor in uh, Heck uh, Lausanne okay uh, and I, I do believe that he jointly with uh, Soren Asmussen uh, has uh, some uh, results uh, on uh, uh, this uh, Feynman Katz formula, and right. uh, uh, for sure, Mochanov uh, should know about this uh, uh, this results. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, only few uh, uh, few names. Uh, but my my basic question uh, is the following: uh, uh, Where are applications of this model? Ah, that's an excellent question. Okay, so uh, this model. I think, to be honest with you, I think this problem is somehow, this is, a, this is really a toy model, okay? Uh, I'm not the one to really tell you confidently about, about applications, about real applications, right? What but I know you, is that... You can write me if you don't want to talk here. <laughs> no, 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 I just, let me just say this, you know, what I, what, what I know, or what, what I think that I know is the following, that... Um, the main interest of this model, despite being such a simple model, extremely simple model, the main interest is that it does exhibit, despite the simplicity, it does show this intermittent effect, okay? Maybe the intermittent effect doesn't even really correspond exactly to the intermittency that we would see in some interesting real uh, uh, applications, okay? I'm, I'm not sure of that. But I, what I know is that this is a really interesting effect that is, can be really complicated, that the systems in which it appears are extremely complicated, perhaps. So it's really nice to have a model that is extremely simple and that uh, you can show this effect and also that you can, uh, let's say, analyze the effect, show where it comes from, uh, deal with it somehow, you see? So this is where I see, in my opinion, so far, 
this is where I see most of the interest of this model, both in theory and in applications. This is where I think it comes from. But, okay. uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh huh. Uh, I, I wrote a line here. Uh, this TCA model was uh, 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 obtained uh, 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 through exams, uh, through uh, to trials 34, and after that it was forgotten. And in in the literature, you might find it as a moot model 71. Mm -hmm. But this moot didn't tell nothing about TCA. <laughs> Where is the, ah. uh, this is uh, only only observation. Okay. Uh, well, but, uh, if you can give me these uh, these references later. It's going to be interesting. For uh, uh, yeah, send, send me send me email. I, I'll send this. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, but uh, congratulations. Uh, Thanks I'm, a lot. I, I'm almost expert in your field already. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I did a good job. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, boy. Thanks a lot. Congratulations. Uh, you are you, you are uh, uh, from. Uh, uh, Cruzeiro or to, to America uh, you support? In Neither of them. I'm Neither. not really a football person. I'm not really such a football person. But, oh, uh, you, you have to turn to forget the mathematics. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Uh, good, uh, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All the best. Anyone have any other question or comment? No, I have a question. So, okay. Uh, you prove the existence of a radium, right? So, and you prove that your computation uh, of mass will be. It's me? Or I don't know. No, okay. Ah, wait. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, let's see. Yes, sorry. I, I'm messing up here. I, I didn't get your question. Sorry, sorry, Alini. Could you say again? That uh, you have this distance of radius, uh, radius where all your mass will be concentrated in, right? Uh, in, in this theorem here, right? Yes, it is only depend on epsilon, right? Exactly, exactly. Do you have any? Because uh, it seems that uh, at least uh, it seems that it's not that big, right? If I'm understood well, your model. Like, do you have uh, the expected size of this, or, or you see what I mean? Because your eye yeah. seems to be not that big, right? That's true. So this is a feature of those of the of the double exponential tails. Yeah, okay? I'm just saying that you prove the existence, and I'm asking if you have the expected size of this R. Like, how ah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So so just to begin, this R here is really. A deterministic constant. Okay? Yeah, it depends on epsilon, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, this here it depends. Uh, this here depends. Uh, depends on epsilon, and it depends on rho. Okay. If we have larger rho, uh, we can expect whole, right. Your whole so, your whole comes from the double exponential, right? Precisely. Yes. So if you have larger rho, then you expect things to be more concentrated. So this, for the same epsilon, you can probably get a smaller r. Okay, I can tell you a little bit about where this computation here comes from, where this r here comes from. Okay, uh, which is the following. So I was just telling you about these uh, eigenfunctions, right? Where was I with the eigenfunctions here? Eigenfunctions of the Anderson operator. So basically, okay, it's not exactly this that I wrote here, but uh, some way along the proof, we are going to have a certain, uh, we're going to prove a certain concentration of the solution in some small area, and somewhere here inside, there's going to be this point Z of T, okay? The point is random, the region is random, all right, but as I look at the principal eigenfunction inside this region, this principal eigenfunction is going to be is going to have a really good exponential uh, decay away from this point. And actually, this decay can be bounded, can be estimated deterministically. Okay, so by estimating 
the decay of say the L1 norm of this of this eigenfunction here, I can find the radius, the radius R that corresponds to most of the L1 mass of this of this eigenfunction. Okay. And then I have to compare the eigenfunction with the solution. And we also show that the solution is very well approximated by this eigenfunction. Well, the solution outside of this region is very small, okay, it's almost nothing. And inside this region, it's very well approximated by the eigenfunction. So this is where it comes from. It's from this decay of the eigenfunction that we can control really inside this region of, of interest. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Anyone have oh, a thank you? Question? Yeah, I have one. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, th thank you for your for your uh, talk. It, uh, it was a pleasure. Great pleasure. And uh, so, so, so my, my my question is uh, more or less uh, in the same direction as as Alinis. Uh, so, but, but uh, with respect to Z, so so you 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 have a. Um, uh, Sort of love large numbers for 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 for, for that. Uh, sorry, um, uh, result of uh, convergence in distribution for for. Yeah. Uh, so so so, um, so do you expect or can you say some something uh, uh, in this model or in some other one related uh, to to for uh, a convergence of of the. Of the trajectory, I mean, uh, uh, sort of the the, uh, the uh, some sort of um, of uh, invariance principle, or if, uh, the, the, uh, okay, yeah. So, so actually, actually, we do. Okay, we we can extend this to um, for this process here for for this exact process. Okay, um, I can in fact write a scaling limit for this. Okay. It comes out of this representation. I didn't get to tell you about this representation, but it comes, this is a kind of uh, uh, maximization problem. This is the arg max of something. Okay, I, I can maybe show you this really quickly here. I have this on the last slides. Okay, uh, out of something that I didn't show you, that I was planning to show you, what happens is that I can write a certain functional can write this functional here that has to do with principal eigenvalues in different regions, in regions D, and also points in these regions. We can think about these points as the maximum of the, of the potential in there, and the principal eigenvalue of the Anderson operator inside the region. Okay, I uh, optimize, I take the arc max of the region, and I take my point Z to be exactly the maximizer of the potential inside the best region, okay? This is how you can, well, it's not the unique way, of course, but it's one way that works that you can define this, um, this locus. And well, defined in this way, or maybe defined in a more careful way, I actually have to be a bit more careful, I'm hiding th some things here, but uh, uh, basically because of this sort of definition and also because of this that I also didn't tell you about, that I have a certain Poisson, uh, that I have a point process convergence to a Poisson point process of these eigenvalues, then I can pass the argmax also to the limit. And I can do this in a functional way. All right? So the answer is yes. But I still want to say something. And the something is the following, is the meaning of this. Because the meaning of this is maybe not what you are expecting, OK? The problem is, since I'm talking about the parabolic Anderson model, I'm talking about this expected value of that particle system, right? So I'm not talking about the evolution of the particle system itself, all right? So this functional convergence here doesn't really represent what is happening with the underlying particle system. This is going to be something a little bit different. The, 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 there is some literature about this, about the particle system itself. I didn't mention this, maybe I should have. Uh, there is some literature about this by uh, two guys from Bath, uh, which are Matt Roberts and Marcel Ortiz, and they do this in the case, in this case here, where you have Pareto tails. 
But as far as I know, there not, there's not a lot more of results of the particle system itself. So, I mean, this is of limited interest, so to speak, because we are not really showing anything about the underlying particle system, okay? All right, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Do we have more questions or comments? Just uh, rapidly, sorry, Renato, just asking uh, uh, rapidly, you, you said about uh, the random uh, random uh, tree somehow. Yeah, so okay. Renato, what, but uh, in, what, what in the case of uh, just simple uh, infinite tree? Uh, is it easier to get uh, localization? Or is, uh, is it much more complicated? Uh, no, I don't think it's easier. Actually, uh, this case is contained in here in this theorem, at least. Well, we have to really have exponential growth for this here to work, okay? But the case of a homogeneous deterministic tree is all right. Um, but this fact that to get localization or not, well, okay, there's going to be a few things that are going to be easier to deal with. And, um, uh, ah, I, I, sorry, uh, yeah, I forgot to stress something that is really important about this work. I really completely forgot about this. Is written here, but I didn't stress it enough, is the following. We are only dealing with uniformly bounded offspring. This is a very strong technical condition that we are working under, okay? So we are only considering trees that are, whose degrees are uniformly bounded, okay? So to go away from this requirement, this is something much harder. Well, much harder, much a lot different. There's going to be a lot of things, technical things that we're going to have to deal with. But uh, within this uh, this condition here, which includes, you know, a, a tree with homogeneous homogeneous degree everywhere, then the, I don't think it's much more complicated. I think the technical tools that you're going to use are, are not very different. Because you still have the random potential to deal with, right? There's the randomness coming from the from from the potential. So, yeah, it's a little bit easier, but I don't think it's like really clearly more uh, e easier. Okay, thank you. Okay. We have more questions. If not, let's thank Renato again, please. We can continue. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again for the invitation. It was a big pleasure. It was really, really good. Really. I feel like a Nikolai, almost a uh, uh, specialist. <laughs> Expert. Expert. Excellent. Excellent. Expert. I'm, <laughs> I'm impressed. 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 I'm impressed.